It is 11.56. We are live, and the Cavs are up 2-0 on the Orlando Magic. We're going to break it all down coming up on the Ultimate Cavalier Show. Another day, another win for the Cleveland Cavaliers, who are now up 2-0 against the Orlando Magic in the first round of the Eastern Conference playoffs. Guys, a lot of what we saw tonight was very, very, very similar to what we saw in Game 1 on Saturday. Another tremendous defensive effort, another sloppy shooting night from both teams, and another night where J.B. Bickerstaff, frankly, outcoached a finalist for the 2023-2024 NBA Coach of the Year award in his best friend, Jamal Mosley. We're going to get to all of that and try to get to some of your comments here at the end. I know it's late, 7 o'clock start. I literally walked in my apartment two minutes ago, so I apologize for the late start, but we are still going to break this down here as we always do after playoff games for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Let's start with what I think is the biggest takeaway from this game, and that is in playoff games, in games that matter and series that matter on a stage like this, it is up to your stars and your superstars to come through in the clutch. It is when these guys make the money that they are paid in their contract. What you do for 82 games in the regular season is nice, but this is where the best players have to shine. And today, Donovan Mitchell in the first half played like an absolute superstar. He had 19 points in the first half, seven rebounds, three assists, one steal, one block. He had a team high, plus 16 in the first half alone. The second half, he slowed down a bit. Orlando made some adjustments. He has to find his adjustments to their adjustments in game three. But in the first half, Orlando had no answer for Spider-Man. Donovan Mitchell was the best player on the court. He got things going offensively for the Cavs. He talked about it in his post-game presser, how he puts it upon himself to ensure his team gets off to good starts, and that's being uber-aggressive offensively because he knows the struggles Orlando has on the offensive end of the court. And with Mobley and with Allen and with Isaac and the defensive players Cleveland has, if they get an early lead, it is very difficult for Orlando to claw their way back into the contest. So Donovan coming out with the intentional desire to put this team up, but it's not just shooting. He was playmaking as well. Those three assists, he could have had five or six if his teammates made a couple shots. But he was generating open looks time after time after time after time. And that put Cleveland in a position to score 30 points in the first quarter. It's the second game in a row the Cavs have had their highest scoring quarter come in the first. They did it in game one. They did it again today in game number two. Their second half offensive performance, they scored 38 points in the second half. That's frankly not good enough, and we'll talk about that in a sec. But they scored 58 in the first half, and that was more than enough to put away the Orlando Magic. I said this about midway through the second quarter, and I feel better about it now than I did at the second quarter when I said it at first. On both teams, the only player I really trust to consistently generate open looks is Donovan Mitchell. And in a series with two good defensive teams where the refs are allowing a ton of physicality, it's going to be tough to generate open looks on a consistent basis, and you have the only guy, when I say you, I mean the Cavs, you have the only guy who's capable of time after time, regardless of who's defending him, regardless of the coverage of the defense, who is capable of getting to his spot and making a right play for either him or his teammates. Paolo Bancaro hasn't done that. He has 15 turnovers in two games. Franz Wagner hasn't done it. He had a better shooting performance tonight. He had six turnovers as well. That's more than he had made field goals. You go down the rest of the roster, Jalen Suggs, who got hurt, and that changed the complexion of this game, had five assists, but you're not worried about him scoring. I mean, Mo, Wag Mo Wagner had a better game off the bench, but whatever. The only guy in this series that you can trust and rely on time after time to generate those good looks is Donovan Mitchell, and he did it in game one with a 30-point performance. He did it with a 19-point first half in game two. And the Cavs are going to need that in game three, game four, and if needed, game five, six, and seven to pull off a series win. But what Donovan did in the first half tonight was a special performance. And moments like that are exactly why the Cavaliers made the trade for him in the first place. That is the caliber of player 
you give up all those assets for. So in a playoff series against a good defensive team, you have the advantage. And I challenge you to go back and watch every single possession that Orlando had, not only today, but essentially in game one as well. How many open, uncontested looks did they have? You could probably count them on two hands. Very few and far between. That's because none of their guys are the creative playmakers in the sense that Donovan is. Even Paolo, he's not a guy that's going to break it down off the dribble. He wants to get you to the high post, put his shoulder into you, hit a little fadeaway. You can contest that. What you can't contest is Donovan Mitchell going side to side, forward and backward, shifting his body in and out, drawing in three defenders and kicking to a guy in the corner for a wide open three. The Cavaliers have that with Donovan, and at times they have it with Karras and DG. Orlando doesn't have that. Speaking of Darius Garland, he had a stretch in the third quarter where he scored 11 of the team's 13 points. Back-to-back threes. Then he hit a step back. Then he drove past Paolo Bancaro for a little scoop shot. It's flashes like that that drive Cavs fans and myself crazy because you see the potential. We just need it more consistently. He's trying to figure out where he fits into this series because we've talked about it time after time. After suffering the jaw injury earlier this year, I feel like he's a little hesitant to deal with some contact in the paint just because he's been more fragile, maybe doesn't feel as strong as he normally has. And this series, they're letting guys play through a ton of contact. They're not calling a lot of hand checks. They're not calling a lot of bumps out on the perimeter. So to see him go through a stretch in the first half where he had foul trouble, couldn't get into a rhythm, to then go in the second half with Donovan on the bench, the team in a bit of a scoring drought. He comes through and scores 11 of 13. That was big. That was big. It, it really gave the Cavs a jolt of energy and propelled them into the fourth quarter, which Orlando then changed their defense completely in the fourth and it threw Cleveland off. But that gave them the cushion. It brought the lead to 22. It was an insurmountable lead for Orlando to come back from. And it was big for Darius, I think, from a confidence perspective, to have that stretch of not perfect basketball, but damn good basketball. How about Jared Allen tonight, guys? 20 rebounds. I believe that's the second or third most ever in a playoff game for the Cleveland Cavaliers. He had 16 points. He was a plus 12, a team best plus 12 in the plus minus category. Six of 10 from the floor, 11 defensive rebounds, nine offensive rebounds, three assists, two steals, two blocks. Another all-around performance from Jared Allen. And we talked about going into this series. All right, the Cavs got to rebound. They got to win the rebounding battle. If the Cavs don't rebound, that is Orlando's chance to score. They don't have the shooting. But if they get offensive rebounds, it'll be a tough night for the Cleveland Cavaliers defensively just with all the extra shot attempts that'll generate. As a team, the Magic had 11 offensive rebounds tonight. Jared Allen had 11 defensive rebounds. Jared Allen had nine offensive rebounds by himself. The Cavs, for the second straight game, have won the rebounding battle. They won game one by 14. They won tonight by seven. They are plus 21 on the glass through two games. I saw a stat. Tony Pesta tweeted this out. Through two games, Jared Allen has 38 rebounds. That's two games against the Magic, 38 total rebounds for Jared Allen. In five games against the Knicks last season, Jared Allen had 37 rebounds. Think about that. Two games versus Orlando, 38 rebounds. Five games last year against New York, 37 rebounds. You're seeing the step and the maturation of some of these guys. He had the comment last year, the lights were too bright, were soft. It was obviously a terrible postseason series for Jared. And he's embraced that. And even tonight, we spoke to him after the game. And he said, it's two games. We got to win a series before anything changes. And I mentioned the same thing on... Saturday after they won game one. But he is well aware of the perception of not only himself, but this team. And he understands the only way to change that perception is to go out and prove it on the court. And through two games, and once again, it's two games, they have done everything they could do to try and change the perception. They have not played well enough offensively as a team to beat the the best teams in the East or the West. But they've played plenty well enough to beat the Orlando Magic. This actually feels almost to a T like last year's playoff series against the Knicks, except the roles are reversed. This year, the Cavs are in the Knicks spot. More seasoned, more shooting, better coached, not afraid of the moment. And the Magic feel like last year's Cavs, where their roster is talented enough to win games in the regular season, but clearly flawed in the way you need to win in the postseason. 
They play hard as hell during the regular season. They pick up some big wins on random occasions because they frankly wanted it more than the Denver Nuggets or the Los Angeles Lakers or somebody who didn't really put as much effort into the regular season. They come into the postseason with expectations, but it's false expectations because they were never as good as they really thought they could be based off what they did in the regular season. That Magic roster is flawed. They can't shoot. Jason Lloyd went blue in the face last year, shooting, 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 shooting. The Cavs made it a priority this offseason. Max Struess, George Niang. The Magic have none of those guys. They can't shoot. They shot better today. You ready for this? The Magic shot significantly better today from three than they did in game one. They shot 26% from the three-point line. That was significantly better. They made nine threes. Nine of 35, 27%, uh, 25.7%. That's a step up from game one, but it's a flawed roster. So the Cavs was not another perfect performance. I would give it once again a C-plus, B-minus offensively. They get an A-plus defensively, but they still have so much room to improve on the offensive end, which gives you encouragement that the ceiling for this team may be a little higher than we may have given them credit for beforehand. I thought from a defensive perspective, once again, they contested everything. Everything that Orlando chucked up. J.B. Bickerstaff said, you know, in a game like this, what you measure and what you want to quantify from your defense is how many open and easy looks do we give our opponent. I'm telling you guys, there weren't many. It's going to happen. You're going to get a couple good looks. They got some transition points. But everything Paolo did, he had to work for. Franz Wagner, every shot towards the rim was contested. I'm looking at the box score. He was 5 of 17 from the floor. Jonathan Isaac. One of seven, all seven were threes. They didn't give a six foot 10 guy with seven foot four wingspan with athleticism. They didn't allow him to take a single field goal in the paint. Why? Because Evan Mobley and Jared Allen were the more physical bigs in this game. They pushed him to the corner, relegated Jonathan Isaac to essentially a three and D guy, despite the fact he's a damn near seven footer with bounce. Wendell Carter, one for seven from the floor. Cole Anthony 0 for 4. He's going back-to-back -back games without scoring. Yeah, Mo Wagner got 12 points off the bench. But the Cavs, once again defensively, did a terrific job. Gary Harris made a couple threes. He was their best offensive player tonight, and he had 14 points. Like, all in all, and Palo scored more. He had 21, but he also had six turnovers. So I didn't love how he played offensively. The Cavs are just everywhere on defense. Orlando, I'm frankly confused at what they're trying to accomplish offensively because it just doesn't seem like there's any rhythm or flow to what they're trying to do, which plays right into Cleveland's hand defensively. They play Allen and Mobley together, which makes it, especially with the refs not calling anything, damn near impossible to score around the paint. You have two elite rim protectors. Elite might be a little strong. Two very good rim protectors alongside guys like Donovan and Darius and Struess or Niang or Isaac Okoro, if he's in there, just yucking things up and making it difficult. It feels like the Magic are trying to run through quicksand on offense. Nothing is coming easy. Seriously, everything they're trying to do is coming against some sort of contested defense. The Cavs, I thought, did a great job switching. Their game plan against the Magic's high pick and roll today worked flawlessly. And you're able to do that because you're not scared of Paolo Bancaro or Jalen Suggs or Gary Harris or whoever the ball handler is really breaking you down one-on-one -on -one from 30 feet away from the basket. That's the advantage I was talking about earlier with Donovan Mitchell. If you switch and you have Palo on Donovan 30 feet from the bucket, good luck trying to stop that. Donovan's getting past you, drawing in the defense, kicking it out, or finishing himself. You're just not worried about that from the Orlando offensive standpoint, which allows Cleveland to compact its defense. It's, it's not a pack line defense like the University of Virginia plays, but essentially against this Magic team, they're kind of using some similar, not terminology, but some similar principles. Where it's everything's contested, everything's congested. You're not going to drive. There's no easy lanes for you to slice and dice your way through. If you're going to get to the cup, you're going to have to get through three, four guys, six, seven different arms and hands, and that's not easy. And if you do get in there, well, good luck shooting over Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Hasn't worked yet. Is it going to work in games three and four? Maybe. Maybe. You're at home. I expect these guys to shoot a little better, especially the role players at home. It happens every year in the playoffs. You guys struggle on the road. They come home, they shoot better at home, but for the most part, I, I don't really see an offensive game plan that can be drawn up with the players on the Magic roster that'll be effective against this Cleveland defense. I don't, I, like, where are you going to find a ball handler to break these guys down? 
Is it Cole Anthony? Uh, maybe, but he has zero points and zero points in back-to-back -back games here. Is it Jalen Suggs? He just sprained his knee today. He came back, played in the second half. Like, maybe, but not. I'm not scared of that. Like, I'm asking you guys, put them in the comments. Who, who scares you as a pick-and-roll ball handler, as a creator for Orlando? And, and don't say Paolo Bancaro because, yes, he can create on his own, but he's not a guy that's going to go one-on-one -on -one from 30 feet from the basket and really scare you. He's just too big. It's, that's not his game. I, I, I don't know if that player exists on this roster, and I'm not quite sure where Orlando is going to turn to to try and get some offensive creation and execution. I, I just don't think that guy in the roster exists, and, and it's no disrespect to the guys, but they don't have it. They don't. I need a, a sip of water there. Let's talk about Mo Wagner for a sec, guys. <coughs> Excuse me. He had 12 points, six rebounds tonight. He fouled out. He had two steals, a turnover. Missed both his threes. He was two or four from the free throw line. I'm not sure. And I love this about Cleveland. This is one of my favorite parts about Cleveland. Like, they find a villain in any sport, and the way that they find hatred for a guy from, like, the deepest depths of their soul is awesome. And in this series, it's been Mo Wagner. He's a bit of a dirty player. I, I give you that. He's feisty. If he was on Cleveland, you'd love him. He kind of looks like a taller Joe Burrow if Joe Burrow got smacked with the ugly stick. He had a filthy dunk on Jared Allen. He took out a fan. And then when he got his sixth foul and got kicked out, the way the crowd reacted and cheered him on, and, and not cheered him on, but cheered for his ejection, was one of the cooler things I've ever seen in a professional sporting arena. And then Wagner looked like, from my angle, he started chirping with a fan. I'm not 100% sure if that's accurate, but from my angle, it looked like he was chirping with the fan on his way out. And I just want to give Cleveland and Cleveland fans kudos for finding a random, insignificant player in this series to hate the way you guys have began to hate Mo Wagner. That is awesome. Keep it up. Keep that intensity up. A couple other things I've noticed from the sidelines today. Uh, Marcus Morris and Tristan Thompson, they stand up the entire game. I would love and I would pay ungodly amounts of money to have Bally's mic those two up for a game and then release the unedited raw audio. I would pay ungodly amounts of money for that because I don't know what the hell they're talking about, but I am dying to find out. Dying to find out. They stand up and cheer on every single play. That's the epitome of a great teammate. And I'm not sure when it's going to happen. It may not be this series. Maybe next series, who the hell knows? One of those guys is going to have a big-ass role in a game, and they're going to win a game to this, this postseason for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Some other things I noticed. How about the bench today? Isaac Okoro, 10 points, had eight in the second quarter. Karis LeVert had eight in the first quarter. You get 18 points off the bench from those two. I thought Karis, who had a, in my opinion, subpar performance in game one, Came back with a really, really, really solid performance in game two. Isaac Okoro had four steals in this contest, which may have been more valuable than the 10 points he contributed off the bench. He was two of five from three. He also had an assist. He had the emphatic slam to end the game. You love to get 18 points from your bench, guys. It takes so much pressure off your starters when you when you can sub them in and out and not lose that offensive production. Max Struess, nine rebounds, four assists. He only had seven points. He's 1 of 5 from 3 again. That makes him 2 of 10 for the series. Max is a guy I'm not worried about making shots. He's been here. He's done this before. He's not the one I'm worried about making shots. The guy I am worried about is George Niang because this is two games in a row now where Niang has not shot the ball well. I thought he's done a decent job keeping a body between Palo and the bucket. Palo has shot over and scored over him, but at least he's staying in front of him. But if he's not making his threes, uh, I don't think his playing time warrants as many minutes as he got in game one. That actually got cut back. In game one, George played 24 and a half minutes. Today, he played 13 and a half. So, J.B. Bickerstaff made the adjustment, and I think it was the third quarter. Uh, I, I made a note of it. Hold on. In the – where is it? 
Uh, second quarter, excuse me. Second quarter, uh, Orlando went on a bit of a run when JB went with his bench unit. He put Niang in, he put Lavert in, and they went on a bit of a run. As soon as they started going on a run, it was an 8-2 run. JB pulled the guys, put Allen back in the game, went back to Struess, and the Cavs countered with a 13-3 run of their own. So kudos to JB Bickerstaff for not sticking with his rotations. He wasn't strict with it. He was adjustable. He made counters. And like I said, so far through two games, the Cavs haven't been perfect, but they've been plenty good to dominate this series. They haven't trailed yet, by the way. They have led for every second in two games. What's 48 times two? Uh, 50 times two is 100. So it's 96 minutes of basketball. The Cavs have led for all 96. In two games, the Cavs have only allowed the Magic to score a total of 169 points. A total of 169 points. That's 84 and a half points per game. Like, I don't think you understand, and maybe you do, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm hyping this up enough, how incredible that is in today's day and age to hold a team to 84 and a half points over a two-game stretch. Yes, Orlando's missed a bunch of shots. Yes, you can point to some open looks. They have not shot the ball well. That is all valid. But the Cavs have forced over 30 turnovers in two games. Uh, let me make sure that's, that math's correct. Here's the game one box score. No, they forced 28 turnovers in two games. Sorry, just shy of 30 turnovers. They're holding Orlando to 35% shooting through two games. They are contesting everything. They are making everything difficult. They are making life hell for everyone on that Orlando offense to try and generate anything. And as someone who played, D3 is not the NBA. Granted, I understand, but I still played at a competitive level past rec league in high school. When you have teams that are, have their hands in their passing lane, that are communicating, that are moving as one, all five guys shifting together, they're executing their coverages, and you can't get anything going offensively, it's demoralizing. And I have to imagine as Orlando's on the plane right now, flying back home, they're searching for answers. And like I said before, I'm not quite sure the answer is there. I don't know who they turn to other than the only thing I can think of, the only adjustment I think Orlando could make just based on their personnel is if they go supersized, and they did it for a tiny bit today, but if you go like Suggs, Franz Wagner, Bancaro, Mo Wagner, and Isaac, or Isaac or Wendell Carter Jr., you can't shoot worse, so you're not like you're sacrificing any shooting and just hope that you could destroy the Cavs on the glass. It hasn't happened yet. That might be their only counter, but if that's their counter, I think the Cavs can run them off the court, get them in transition, run them up and down. Like, I think the Cavs have a counter punch to that counter. I just don't know what Orlando's going to do here. And it's crazy because, like I said to start, the Cavs offensively have played two back-to-back C plus B minus games. And that's not me telling you that, guys. Go listen to what Donovan said post game. Donovan said, hey, I'm happy we won, but this wasn't good enough. We know we didn't play good enough. We have to play better to beat Orlando two more times, to beat whoever we play in the next round, to keep advancing in the playoffs. Those were Donovan's words, not mine. I agree with his assessment, but it's not me being critical. That's the guys on the team self-evaluating. JB said the same thing. Jarrett said the same thing. You're happy with two wins, but you know you can play a whole lot better, and that's encouraging in my mind as the series shifts to Orlando because I would assume Orlando, who is a much better team at home than on the road during the regular season, will play better. Their role guys literally can't shoot worse. I know we said that last game. They improved a tiny bit, but still they are not a 35% team from the floor and a 25% team from three. They'll shoot a little better. But the Cavs can also shoot better. And if those two even each other out, I don't know what to say. The Cavs are going to win. They're a better team. They have an advantage in all the main categories. They have an advantage everywhere you want. So I'm going to get to some fan comments in one sec before we wrap it up. Appreciate everyone tuning in late on a, what's today? On a Monday night. Game three is on Thursday. We'll do the same thing. But luckily, there's no post game on Thursday. So this will happen way sooner. It's probably a 9.30 stream, not an 11 o'clock stream. But the Cavs are up 2-0 in this series without playing their A game. And that's a damn good feeling to know that they can play so much better. And even without playing their A game, They've trailed for zero seconds this series. They have led all 48 minutes. Defensively, you can't ask for anything more. They've been tremendous. They've rebounded. They've done just enough offensively, and their defense has been good enough to beat any team in the Eastern Conference if they play with this level of intensity start to finish. All right, let's try to get to some comments here. 
Uh, and then we will wrap up because I got to be at work at seven in the morning. So let's see. Let's see. Where can we start? Uh, I did not forget. Uh, let's see. MK0804 says we will be down two nothing against any of the six other seeds. That is not true. This level of defense wins. I don't know if you'd be down 02. I don't think you'd be up 02 against every team, but I don't think that is, uh, that is accurate. James Brinks says the Magic are trash. I want to hear that Orlando song now. Yeah, they have not been good through two games. Abdul Smith says we got to get a better offensive rhythm. I agree. They absolutely do. Uh, Pee Wee says I think the Cavs will be down by 10 in game three, then come back. They haven't trailed yet. Uh, Lavert did show up. Uh, KW out. Uh, Abdul says they better not get complacent. Their post-game pressure makes me believe they understand they did not play well enough. They are not happy with these performances, and I do expect them to play better, even on the road. KW says, right now I see too many turnovers. Yeah, that's something I didn't address, and I probably missed on my end. They had 15 today. They had 8, 17 in game one, 32 in two games. Too many sloppy turnovers. That, that's the thing. There's too many turnovers that aren't needed. They're trying to force the action when it's not there. When this team is not... When they're playing a team like the Magic who's not making shots, you don't have to force anything. Just take your time, make the right pass, not the home run pass, and that'll happen. But KW, good call on that. Uh, Adam says, McNuggets give us late night recap. Love it. I told you I'd be here. Listen, I told you I'd be there. Uh, just takes a while. You got to remember, these press conferences happen. Then I got to get home. Then I got to set up. So uh, Wahoo fan says, no Sam Merrill or T. Thompson for this series. Did it him today. Sam's going to be on a game-by-game -game basis, game-by-game -game basis. So uh, he played a little bit in game one when Karras didn't play well. Karras came out, started hot today, and then he didn't get a chance to play today. So we'll go from there. Oh, for Jackson says we need a better coach. Hey, JB's out coaching Jamal Mosley right now. So we can only talk about what we got at the moment, and right now he is out coaching the opposition. Fall Gross says Nanny needs to make an open three. Absolutely. Uh, Brandon said I think the Magic will win one game at home, but wouldn't be surprised if they get to six games. That was the pick for me before in six. I think I'm changing that to Cavs in five now. Jared Allen was awesome today. I agree, Soul Train. Uh, Ofer says the Franz brothers, the Wagner brothers, Franz is the younger one, will shoot better from three. Uh, Miles Garrett was there. So was the Dewan Jones was also there. Uh, Demond said, I want to see Mobley or Niang stretch the floor. The next series, we're going to need a floor spacer. Yeah, they need to. And I, I want to emphasize this again. Mobley needs to keep making threes, keep shooting threes, keep making threes. That changes everything. If Mobley's making threes, that's when the Cavs are at their best. There's no if, ands or buts about that. Mobley needs to continue to shoot and make threes tonight. He was uh, one of four from three. I like the fact he took four threes. So it's a positive sign and a step in a uh, positive step in the right direction. Rob Cunningham says, since Cavs seem to go up 17 plus, the ninth and tenth man should play a few minutes so stars are fresher during the fourth quarter. Rob, I don't hate to do that, but I do know if it happens and Orlando cuts into the lead, then we get on. JB for not putting his throat or not putting his uh putting his foot on their throat. So I think it goes both ways. But I do think Sam Merrill, especially in that situation, can get those minutes if you're up uh if you're up late like that. Sneed Mobile Tech says, What's up, chicken nuggets? Are you excited for the Cavs to go to Magic Kingdom and get roughed up? Hey, you show me why 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 should any Magic fan be confident right now? Seriously, you tell me why should any Magic fan be confident right now? You guys have scored 169 points in two games. You tell me. I mean, tell me. You made nine threes today. You made eight threes. You guys are 17 of 72 from three in two games. 17 of 72 from three in two games. Y'all tell me why. Y'all, Yeah, it, what he said. Demore, Magic can't shoot to save their life. That is true. Uh, it's not been good. In the fourth quarter, um, Orlando blitzed a bunch of pick and rolls. The Cavs have to be better against the blitz. I'll do a little breakdown on that tomorrow for the Cavs show. I got to see the film. And kind of look into and digest exactly how uh, how they were blitzing and what the weak side was going and, and and working with. But obviously, in the moment, I wasn't able to check that out uh, and and do that for 
uh, tonight, but we'll get to that tomorrow on the Ultimate Cavs show. We'll be doing a ton of Cavs reaction tomorrow on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, which starts at 11 a.m. as always, so make sure you guys tune into that. appreciate you guys tuning into this. It is 11.26. I got to get to bed and be at work in seven hours. Appreciate you guys, and I appreciate the Cavs for giving us a lot of positive things to talk about. 2-0 and is 2-0 and no matter how you slice and dice it, and the Cavs can play better. So we appreciate y'all. I'll see you tomorrow. Peace.